Okay, today, uh, since we got a little bit fast at the end of last period, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about this subject of uh, the potential distribution um, around a test particle. So the idea is that what we had calculated and um, is that if we imagine that we have a, a plasma with various plus, minus, plus, uh, plus, plus, minus, minus, you know, charge neutral plasma here, if I get an equal number of electrons and ions, and then I, I single out one particular particle, and I say it has a test charge Q sub T, and then what we did was we looked at or tried to calculate what is the potential distribution around that test particle, and what it turned out to be, and this is what a, um, we didn't really derive this, I just told you what it is more or less as a solution of an equation, is it's the, the test charge times a, what we'll, what we'll end up calling a Debye shielding factor, e to the minus r over lambda Debye, and then divided by the, the factor 4 pi epsilon naught, which is the great factor for MKS, but one of the virtues of using CGS is, of course, you get rid of the whole 4 pi epsilon naught, but you make life more difficult to calculate otherwise, so, you know, people like to use MKS. And then R, where R is the distance from wherever you are right now to wherever the test particle was. So, you know, we've implicitly uh, then put a coordinate system on all this stuff. Um, such that there's some distance, <laughs> supposed to be a straight line, uh, out to wherever the charge particle is. So that's x sub t. That being invisible, we better do that. And then uh, otherwise, it's just distance x to, to some place there. So if we um, then plot, oh, and well, uh, what we want to do, and I guess since I want to scribble on this page quite a bit, I'll, um, I'll make it uh, um, a particular plot. What I'd like to do then is imagine I was sitting on this, uh, right on this charged particle, and I look at the potential distribution away, distances away from that charged particle. So we'd like to just uh, sketch that. So here we're going to plot the, what I'll call phi sub t, which means the potential around that one test particle due to that one test particle, as a function of little r, which is this distance x minus xt, so it's just the spherical distance uh, away from that charged particle. Now, what we would expect in vacuum is that we, of course, would just have the, the Coulomb potential. So I'll just draw that in like this which would be 1 over uh, x, or 1 over r here. And so this would be the uh, Coulomb potential. Uh, and that's proportional to 1 over r, this distance I am away from that particular charged particle. But what our particular formula had here was that there was a little more to it if I was at this distance we haven't defined yet really, uh, talked about too much, which is called the Debye shielding distance or the Debye length, uh, on distances long compared to that, this exponential factor will cut in and will get a tremendous decrease in the potential around that particle. Again, because all the other particles within a Debye length, within some Debye length, are shielding out the Coulomb potential so that we don't see that one particle. So let's kind of sketch what that really looks like then. Um, so up it, for distances short compared to, say, the Debye length is about here, for distances short compared to that, we do have the Coulomb potential. On the other hand, as we get out towards the Debye length, we get e to the minus r over lambda Debye. And so we get a region in here, and here's sort of the... Debye length. And the idea is then that we don't see a bare, if we were a particle, more than this distance, a Debye length apart, 
we don't really see the Coulomb potential, but rather all the particles between us and that individual test par particle are jiggling around and, and pull are becoming a polarized medium, and they are Debye shielding, is what it's called, out uh, that Coulomb potential over distances uh, large compared to this Debye length. So this is called the, um, the polarization, uh, plasma polarization effect. It's just the fact that charged particles move in response to each other. And we used a, um, just a, a Gibbs distribution law to say, well, if we have a little bit of a potential, the distribution uh, changes a little bit and so forth and so on. So uh, we'll put this uh, chart aside here for a moment and come back and, and get this in meters and talk about something we're talking about in particular. But first to do that, uh, and we'll talk a little more about this in a moment, but let's go back and, and define a few things. Namely, what we had found was that we had defined the Debye length in terms of uh, 1 over Debye length squared, hopefully, was equal to the sum over species of nj qj squared, so that's the number density times the charge uh, uh, of that particular species, divided by epsilon naught tj, and again, I never worry about the odd uh, uh, fact that it's, uh, um, sorry, that uh, I never worry about KT, K, Boltzmann's constant, always use just T. Well, by sum over species, what we mean is that this will become the electron density. By the way, that's the free electron density, not neutral, not ones that are bound into atoms, okay? So it's the free electron density times the elect electron charge, E squared, and then divided by epsilon naught Te. Um, but the sum over species says I have to do the same thing for ions, which are Ni, some ion density, times how many ever charges they have on them. Uh, Zi is going to be the charge on the ion, divided by epsilon naught Ti. Now, by convention, what we had done implicitly in our derivation um, is we had said, well, we'll treat all species as if they can respond to this charge of the electron. But often, uh, people uh, assume that you have immobile or not moving ions. You know, they're big and massive in comparison to electrons. And so people often just neglect this part but it depends really, it, it's implicitly, neglecting it implicitly says you have a higher ion temperature than electron temperature, turns out, uh, well, or some more considerations. But anyway, so the net result of this, now we'd like to get a feeling for how big is this length, okay? It, 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 it's, uh, I can assure you, if you look through the uh, dimensionality here, it is in meters. So let's talk about if we equate just these two parts right here, how big is this length? Well, we can see that then the Debye length is going to be defined as the square root of epsilon naught. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to write it out here in some funny ways. I'm going to write it as epsilon naught over E. So that took care of that part right there. And then uh, I'd like to make, uh, so I'm going to have an NE down here. And I'd like to write the electron temperature truthfully in terms of this unit of electron volt as an energy or a temperature rather than degrees Kelvin. And the way I do that is I write it as T sub E over E. That then says measure the electron temperature or energy in terms of electron volts. So if I do this, then we can write this uh, Epsilon naught is, of course, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 11th. Good number to remember in this course, I might say. Uh, e is 1.6, if I get carried away, 0 02 times 10 to the minus 19th. And then this becomes the square root of the electron temperature in EV divided by the electron density. What units should I use for that? 
Well, we're good MKS guys, right? So it should be in units of meters to the minus 3. Now, if you work this out with your handy calculator, or if you're ambitious, I guess you could do it by hand, but anyway, uh, this then turns out to be lambda to by is 7340 meters, but times the square root of the electron temperature, uh, oops, I see we're off the bottom here, in EV divided by um, N sub E, the electron density, in meters to the minus 3. Um, what would be a sort of uh, a typical number for this? Well, it turns out that a typical sort of laboratory plasma, uh, there being here on campus uh, some tokamak plasmas and phaedrus in the engineering research building and also um, so-called MST reverse field pinches over in the physics department. And they, um, I guess I ought to start on a, another piece of paper here. Um, so let's say a typical laboratory magnetically confined plasma, it turns out. But anyway, laboratory plasma might have an electron temperature on the order of one kilo electron volt. Actually, they're not usually quite that hot, but we'd like to have them that hot. Um, so, or this I should write, because of my formula being an EV, write it as 10 to the third electron volts. And then the electron density turns out to be of the order of 10 to the 19th per cubic meter. Uh, for those of you who are like me, always thinking more in terms of CGS units, this can be also be written as 10 to the minus 13 per centimeter cubed. Um, by the way, that's a pretty good vacuum, okay? What's the density of air? Well, it's 10 to the 19th in this unit or 10 to the 25th in those units roundabout. So this is down by six orders of magnitude or so. So it's a pretty good vacuum. Um, well, this will give us, it turns out, then a Debye length of 7,340 times the square root of 10 to the 3 divided by 10 to the 19th. And you'll see I've carefully chosen things so I don't have to do any real algebra uh, or any real arithmetic, I should say. Uh, so this is 10 to the minus 16th, you know, and then I take the square root of it, and then that becomes 10 to the minus 8th. And uh, now you'll also find that in plasma physics we love to approximate things. And so this uh, is obviously about 10 to the 4th, uh, right? Um, so just, you know, we're interested in scale lengths, kind of what order of magnitude are we here. So this is about 10 to the minus 4th meters, or on the order of, you know, 10 to the minus 2, or that is equal to 10 to the minus 2 centimeters, okay? So that tells us that in terms of our rather typical uh, diagram here, that our Debye length is, uh, this particular length is about 10 to the minus fourth uh, meters, okay? Now, um, are we interested on, in phenomena then in that plasma, in that laboratory plasma, uh, on this scale length, that is to say inside of here or longer than here? Well, presumably we've got a plasma, it turns out, that's 10 centimeters or something like that in scale length. So most of the plasma that we're interested in is definitely in this, or most, uh, is mostly in this longer range where we are getting this plasma polarization effect or what amount this is effectively, the collective uh, plasma effects. And so the distinguishing feature, and we'll come back to define this specifically in a moment, of a plasma is that the size of the device is many Debye lengths. So, you know, where most of the charged particles don't see each other. They see only particles within C means experience a force from. They experience the Coulomb potential only from those particles, those other particles that are within about 10 to the minus 4 meters or 10 to the minus 2 centimeters of each other. But if the device is 10 centimeters or something, that's really only very, the part of, any individual particle only really experiences those within a Debye length, and it acts collectively through this polarization of the medium for all the rest of the particles. 
Now, how far apart are typical particles in this laboratory plasma I had? What's their mean separation for a typical laboratory plasma? Well, roughly speaking, delta X is going to be N to the minus one-third, right? So, you know, if I got so many per, per cubic centimeter meter or something like that. Now here, unfortunately, I didn't get the unit or the numbers quite right. So we have 1 over 10 to the 19th to the one-third power. But 10 to the 19th is, of course, 10 to the 18th times 10. And the cube root of 10 is obviously about 2 plus a little bit, you know, 2 cubed is 8. And 10 to the 18th I can take the cube root of. So this becomes 1 half times 10 to the minus 6th meters. Okay. So how big is this on my scale here? Well, you know, let's uh, draw a little scale in here, um, which is n to the minus one third, which is my typical scale length for uh, mean separation of particles. So this is, I'll even leave out the half now, sort of 10 to the minus sixth meters. Where's quantum mechanical effects? Do I need to worry about them? Well, quantum mechanical effects are effectively at the, the Bohr radius or something like that, you know, for the, the binding energy of an electron around an ion. So that's 10 to the minus 8th centimeters or 10 to the minus 10th centimeters. Now, this is kind of a funny logarithmic scale, but I'm just trying to indicate, you know, here. So way down here, okay, is uh, the Bohr radius, which I'll call A sub naught, and that's 10 to the minus 10th meters. Now, our plasma, okay, uh, length of the plasma is of order, let's say, 10 centimeters, which is of order, um, and, uh, well, which is one-tenth of a meter. And so that's sort of way out here to the right. So in some sense, just for this sort of typical laboratory plasma, you see the plasma is a heck of a lot bigger than this Debye length, sort of three orders of magnitude bigger than that. Got a thousand Debye lengths across the plasma. And the mean spacing of the particles is down by another couple orders of magnitude. And the quantum mechanical effects are down by another four orders of magnitude. So roughly speaking, um, we, won't, we will not care about, this would be quantum, sorry, quantum mechanical effects down here. And in most plasma physics, we don't, we don't really worry about quantum mechanical effects. The Coulomb potential is, is perfectly reasonable uh, down to those scale lengths, and for the most part, we need not, um, you know, uh, worry about that. Now, uh, if the mean spacing of the particles is n to the minus one-third, how many particles feel the Coulomb potential of all the other particles and, and act to approximately to give us this Debye shielding cloud? Well, that's effectively a question of, in this distance, the Debye length, how many particles are within that distance. And so uh, for that, our typical laboratory plasma, I can ask the question then, the number of particles inside a Debye, sometimes it's called a cube, sometimes it's called a sphere, uh, depending upon who you're talking to. And that would be... Um, the number density, uh, or electron density actually, not neutral density, because neutrals don't act this way. I mean, we had to have a charge imbalance here, or charge individual charges, times the Debye length cubed. Well, this was like 10 to the 18th. I'm sorry, 10 to the 19th we made it. And then our Debye length uh, per cubic meter, and our Debye length was 10 to the minus 4 meters, and we've got to cube that. So that's 10 to the minus 11th. So that turns out to be 10 to the 7th. So 10 million particles are within one Debye sphere. So um, in other words, what we can say, if we kind of go back to our first picture here, is that this one charge that we picked out, this one test charge, um, all the, all the particles within a Debye length, okay, which was now about 0.01 centimeters, 10 to the minus 2 centimeters, experience mostly just the Coulomb potential from that charge. 
And they adjust themselves because they feel each other's Coulomb potentials. And they, on distances, and there's about 10 to the seventh particles doing that. Okay, a lot of particles, all jiggling around, all moving their position just a little bit in response to this one charge. And of course, this charge is, infl you know, is also causing this other charge to move. And so there's a collective motion there. And all 10 to the seventh particles within a Debye length are then shielding out that Coulomb potential. Okay, they're acting collectively so as to shield out that Coulomb potential. And over distances long compared to this 10 to the minus 2 Debye length, uh, 10 to the minus 2 centimeters uh, Debye length, uh, they're actually shielding out the Coulomb potential. And so particles many more than a Debye length, more, longer distance than a Debye length apart, experience no force. With the, you know, all those 10 to the 7 particles around that one particle shield it out. So it is this, and, and this effectively is then the medium we will be interested in. We won't be interested in these details down below the Debye length. What we will be interested in is if I pluck the plasma at distances long compared to the Debye length, there'll be waves propagating and all sorts of fluid-like responses. It's in the same sense that if I look at air in this room, I get sound waves. I don't worry, uh, the sound waves have a wavelength of, you know, something centimeters to meters and so forth or longer, but I don't worry about the, the molecular interaction distances or even the mean free path between collisions, which are much smaller than that. Okay? So likewise, we won't, for the most part, be worried about the details down around the divide length scale, but we will be interested in some sort of fluid description of the plasma on lengths long compared to the divide length. Okay, with this sort of, uh, sort of introduction or commentary, um, what we're ready to say a little bit then is uh, what, are, what are criteria uh, for, uh, for us having a plasma uh, state, let's call it. So criteria for the plasma state. Well, the first thing is that we need to have systems that are big compared to a Debye length. So we can get this Debye shielding action around any one particle to happen. So I'll write that as L much greater than lambda Debye. Um, so it means the size of the plasma, 10 centimeters in laboratory plasma, is much greater than the Debye length, 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, something like 10 to the minus 4 meters or so. And on that scale length, it turns out we will need um, quasi-neutrality because if I had 10 to this, uh, you can do a little calculation, which is done in Chen, I believe, um, or if not in Bittencourt. Uh, you can show that if I move, try to move a whole bunch of particles the distance of a Debye length apart, they would build up a potential of the order of kT and tend to pull them all back, it turns out. So... We, this will require us to have in equilibrium quasi-neutrality, sum over j, nj, qj is equal to zero, so that the net charge density okay, will be equal to zero. Um, now, what happens near the edge of a plasma? I mean, I, you know, I can, if I have a wall, okay, I don't have any particles there. Uh, any charged particles right at the wall. And as I move away from the wall, I may have trouble having them and so forth and so on. Well, what happens there is we'll get something called a Debye sheath uh, within a few Debye lengths of the wall. And we'll talk about that somewhat later. But for the most part, all I'm concerned about here is to say that as long as our plasma is big compared to the Debye length, our medium is big compared to the Debye length, uh, then it becomes a, a um, um, charge, well, charge neutral plasma. Okay, now another criterion is that if in this interaction distance uh, of this, or inside this collective interaction distance of the Debye length, if we really only had two particles inside of there, then, you know, we just have those, that two-particle interaction. But it's a collective interaction because the interaction is with many particles within the Debye sphere. So because of that, we also have to have a, as a criterion for the existence of a, of a plasma that we have many particles within a Debye sphere. And this uh, 
this is, uh, let's, let's just say, for uh, collective, that is to say, not two-body um, interactions in the plasma. Now, one final condition which I can uh, just sort of uh, mention, let me just say it that way, is that uh, we need to have the way in which uh, Chen writes it is omega tau much greater than 1, where tau is the neutral collision frequency, so, or neutral collision time. So this is uh, neutral collision time, collision of plasma particles with neutrals. So this is neutral collision time. And you can think of it as we're interested in time scales of 1 over a frequency, uh, some frequency of interest. Um, and this is uh, 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 time scale for f uh, collective phenomena in the plasma. Plasma phenomena. So what we have in mind here is just that um, we uh, don't want too many neutral collisions happening within time scales of interest where we're going to be calculating these uh, collective effects. So let me just say it this way, negligible collisions within uh, a collision time. Oh, uh, within a, uh, a collective, um, <laughs> within a collective time scale. Uh, anyway, we're going to be talking about waves and stuff like that, and so there'll be a wave frequency. And as long as that wave frequency is large compared to the neutral collision frequency, um, uh, we'll be able to uh, say that well, we really don't have very many neutral collisions. Um, I'm sorry, and I should be very specific and say these are neutral collisions because we could well have charged particle collisions or Coulomb collisions, uh, and those uh, could be uh, important. Um, okay, there's one other little uh, tidbit uh, which uh, uh, one can do, which is that uh, I had to make an approximation in calculating this uh, potential around the charged particle that we said that in fact that potential of one interaction with the other one was very weak. And it turns out that's generally true um, as, as long as n lambda to bi cubed is much greater than 1. That is to say this also leads, if you just go back through our algebra, to the condition that q phi over t, uh, where phi is the interaction potential uh, Coulomb or, or Debye shielded or whatever, uh, much less than one. So this says that the interaction between any two particles through the Coulomb potential is in fact weak compared to their kinetic energy. And hence, it's a weak interaction and you have many weak interactions simultaneously which give you this collective jelly of plasma that um, Debye shields out individual charge, the Coulomb potentials around individual charged particles uh, on uh, the Debye length sort of scale. Okay, now um, next what I want to do is, is then go on to um, mention uh, somewhat, so, so this, well, uh, to mention some applications and basically uh, without going into details we'll mention various applications where all three of these conditions are met uh, to varying degrees in various plasmas. Uh, some of them meet them very well and some of them meet them not so well. Um, but uh, most of the laboratory type plasmas we're interested in uh, certainly meet them uh, quite well. So let me um, then go on to, uh, to discuss then these um, um, applications or you know, what, what's, uh, what we're going to be talking about in this course good for. Historically, um, and, and I'm going to go through these sort of in somewhat historical order of uh, when they came up, <laughs> when people got interested in them, 
and why, and so forth and so on. Um, the first sort of application is something which is called gas discharges. And the basic idea here is that um, people, uh, particularly uh, Langmuir and Tonks and co-workers during the 1920s, were interested in running very high currents through uh, vacuum tubes. And so as you applied more and more potential to the, to the electrodes and you tried to pull more and more current, you had to kind of put in more and more charged particles so that you could allow that current to be drawn. And as you put in more and more charged particles, you began to get into this Debye shielding phenomenon. And of course, one outcome of all that are the fluorescent light bulbs that we have in this room. Okay? Fluorescent light bulbs are a pretty good plasma. So we always have our example to point to right in the room is uh, um, fluorescent light bulbs. Um, and so here we tend to be talking about temperatures then where you don't really have a fully ionized plasma. Okay? It's a sort of partially ionized plasma. It's a sort of few volts type of, of uh, temperature, it turns out. The electrons are like, oh, say, two electron volts. Uh, the electron density is like, uh, oh, it turns out 10 to the 14th to 10 to the 18th per meter cubed. And if you just figure out our, our Debye length, then it also turns out to be about 10 to the minus 4th meters or 10 to the minus 2 centimeters. Although if the density is a little lower than I said, you, you can actually get up to uh, centimeter type scales. So um, the type of um, gas discharges and such we can talk about are fluorescent lights. Okay. Need an extra E in there, kind of hard to put in. Anyway, fluorescent lights. Um, things like uh, mercury or, and, and neon lamps, okay? Or neon lights, I should say. Uh, mercury arc lamps, various types of arc lamps, you know. Um, things like so called ignitrons, which are ways of uh, controlling very high currents. Um, thyristors or thyrotrons. Um, now, uh, spark gaps, uh, things like that. Uh, let's see, oh, and welding arcs, all kinds of things tend to get into this. Um, and most recently, uh, one is getting into trying to plate uh, various types of ions onto materials, so called plasma processing. Uh, and there you're getting into uh, having a plasma up next to a solid. Uh, and so that's, let's just call that plasma processing, uh, various types of things. Um, how about if I just had a flame? Does that uh, satisfy conditions for a plasma? Well, it turns out you've got enough particles in a device sphere and stuff like that, but it's not always free of neutral collisions. Okay, because, uh, you know, if you stick your hand in a, in a flame, you get burnt, mostly because it's hot, not because it was charged up and electrically, sh you know, you're, you're shorting it out. It's not that. It, it, there aren't too many free charged particles. There are some, you know, so there's too many neutral collisions. But if you have a, a really hot flame, okay, you can, you can actually get into some, uh, some types of, um, uh, of plasma effects. Um, so the basic idea here is we're talking about then weakly, what are called weakly ionized, not fully ionized uh, plasmas. And uh, there's uh, one conference every year which uh, I always get a kick out of the title. It's called the Gaseous Electronics Conference. And uh, of course, you, as you try to pull more and more current through devices, you always supply a little more gas. And so you get into so-called gaseous electronics. Um, also, in a fluorescent light, I might say people sometimes call those positive columns. You pull a, a current through, through an ionized gas, and it's a so-called positive column, which then uh, emits some uh, ultraviolet, which then gets converted into light we see uh, in the uh, edges of a fluorescent light bulb. Um, anyway, so sometimes these are called also uh, positive columns. Um, you apply a positive voltage to it. Anyway. Um, so this whole era started from the, uh, I should have put down from Langmuir 
and hence we'll be talking about Langmuir waves, it turns out, and Tonks in like the 20s. And, uh, you know, it continues to this day um, and uh, get, we'll, it gets used, and I'll mention it again a little bit later in terms of gas lasers. Okay. Now, another thing that came up was something called space physics. Uh, and there's a lot of elements of space physics, but the way this got started is that in the 20s and 30s, people were getting into radio waves. And, uh, you know, they, you had ground propagation of radio waves, all right, from here to some other place. But people observed that if you uh, uh, propagated waves up into the atmosphere, that, by gosh, they came back someplace else. So there was sort of... You know, you were on the surface of the Earth, and if you launched a wave up, it somehow got reflected and came back, and you could communicate over very long distances. What we're going to talk about later in, in some uh, mention in some detail is that there's actually an ionized layer of a weakly ionized layer of uh, called the ionosphere uh, up above the Earth, and that that ionized layer will actually become a plasma, and it will reflect waves off of it back to the Earth. So it's a reflecting layer. So people got, as they began in the 20s and 30s um, to get into uh, radio waves, um, they began to find out that, gee, there's something outside of the Earth that's reflecting radio waves. Um, ionosphere um, reflects radio waves. But Really what happens is, is that there's a, a much um, broader range of phenomena that come up. And so if you uh, think about, well, the sun's, sun's over here. Let's see, we'll make ourselves a, a nice bright sun. So the sun's sitting over here. and you know, it, The sun, it turns out, uh, as we'll mention, is a very good fusion reactor all by itself, gravitationally confined. And it, uh, if you look at the edge of the sun, you know, some, with uh, some detail, you know that there's something going on. And it turns out it's emitting a lot of charged particles. And that charged particle heads in, uh, that group of charged particles heads, to some extent at least, in the direction of the Earth with something called the solar wind, which is a group of charged particles. Um, and it turns out that that solar wind has a density on the order of uh, 5 times 10 to the 6th, um, per meter cubed, and a temperature of about 10 EV, tens of EV, but that's perhaps not so significant. Sort of the drift velocity of these particles is on the order of uh, 300 kilometers a second. This uh, wind of charged particles heads towards the Earth. But now when we get over here to the Earth, okay, so this solar wind's heading towards the Earth, the Earth's sitting here, but the Earth is a magnetized medium. It's a dipole magnet, right? So it's got you know, magnetic fields that do this. And so what happens when this, um, and by the way, it's a north-south, you know, it's roughly vertical here, so you do get this sort of pattern. What happens is this solar wind would like to you know, just, just hit the planet, but the magnetic field kind of deflects these charged particles, and so you get what's called the magnetosphere around the Earth. And there's a whole set of complicated um, <laughs> uh, discussion, let me just say, about, say that, in Figure 4 of uh, Bittencourt. And Bittencourt uh, having, or works at a um, uh, space physics laboratory in Brazil, it turns out, and a um, place called San Jose dos Campos. And he, uh, so he puts a lot of emphasis on some of the details of how this solar wind actually interacts uh, with, the, um, with the Earth. And so it turns out you get things called a neutral sheet out the back. And as you can imagine, you get various layers in here. Uh, the ionosphere is a layer in fairly close, it turns out. It's only you know, tens of kilometers above the Earth. And, uh, and that's a, a charged particle layer. You get the, um, the, the northern lights, they're called, aurora borealis. Uh, those come, it turns out, from charged particles coming down these, these field lines. And as they come into the top of the Earth, they ionize the gas coming up through the Earth. 
Uh, and so you get some northern lights, sheets vertical like that. Um, a little hard to see on here, I see. Um, but anyway, you, you have then a whole uh, spectrum of, of plasma phenomena reaching from the upper atmosphere, tens of kilometers, um, out to distances of many Earth radii, like uh, 10 Earth radii or something like that. This whole interaction of a solar wind of, of, uh, of a lot of charged particles uh, coming into and interacting with the, um, with the Earth. Now, so this got started 20s, 30s, maybe I should even say 40s uh, because of radar and such. Um, got started by the ionospheric, uh, uh, the ionosphere uh, reflecting radio waves. Um, and maybe I should put down just uh, some uh, parameters of the ionosphere, namely it's a density of about 10 to the 12th per meter cubed and uh, an electron te or a temperature of about 0.1 eV. But people have then worked out um, a lot of the details of the, or and, and by virtue of satellite measurements and so forth, they've uh, you know gone up into space and measured these plasma densities. And basically what happens is it decreases from this sort of density up close to the Earth, where it's effectively just ionizing air, um, to essentially these very low numbers in the solar wind uh, very far from the Earth, about six orders of magnitude down in density, but the temperatures go up a, a good bit. And you get so-called Van Allen radiation belts and, and a lot of things like that. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that was a big uh, uh, development uh, going on actually in the 30s and somewhat the 40s. Um, Maybe I should come to think about it. I should remove the 20s. It really got going in the 30s as far as a research subject. Okay, then the big thing that, that started getting people really interested in plasma physics um, was controlled fusion. So let's uh, get to that application. Um, first comment is that uh, the, the best controlled fusion uh, device that's ever uh, available is in fact the sun, okay? The sun, uh, uh, well, but it doesn't use quite the same, uh, so well, I guess I'll just write that down. Anyway, the sun is a gravitationally combined, confined, um, confined plasma. And I'll get my numbers a little bit better today. Um, but uh, the electron temperature uh, is on the order of uh, oh, something like 2 kilo electron volts, uh, and that's 2 times 10 to the 8th degrees Kelvin. And basically, it runs on a hydrogen or proton cycle. Uh, its, its energy uh, is, is gotten by um, fusion of basically protons and all other local nuclei, or, uh, lightweight nuclei, uh, and other light nuclei, but mainly protons, as it turns out. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that we'd like an energy source, and that's what controlled fusion is all about. So let me uh, mention just the nuclear processes going on here. So we have deuterium plus deuterium uh, goes to 3 helium plus a neutron plus 3.2 MeV. Um, and then equally probable, it turns out, is another DD reaction. So these are equally probable. Another DD reaction, which goes to um, a triton plus a proton um, plus 4 MeV. And then the other reaction is if you find some way to produce tritium, then you have deuterium plus tritium goes to helium-4 uh, plus a neutron plus 17.6 MeV. So these are all exothermic reactions, which is nice. You produce net, net energy. The trouble is that they have a threshold energy um, which is on the order of 15 kiloelectron volts. Fundamentally, you know, deuterium ion is a plus charge, 
and another deuterium ion, and you're trying to get them to hit each other. And sure, they may be able to fuse and give you these reactions, but you have to surmount the Coulomb potential barrier. And the threshold for this other reaction, the deuterium-tritium reaction, is about 5 kiloelectron volts. So the idea uh, that you're involved here in is then that, well, gosh, uh, I need to somehow get proton or de deuterons to interact with tritons and uh, do so at energies, kinetic energies at least, greater than 5 or 10 kilovolts above this threshold to surmount the Coulomb potential barrier. Well, to do that, you could imagine, well, you know, I'll say I'll just do it with an accelerator. I'll take a, a deuteron and I'll hit a target. The trouble is, and, and I'll put a lot of tritons in the target, the trouble is, in a target, those tritons all got electrons around them. And so mostly what I, and the electrons jiggle with an electric field much easier, or a Coulomb potential, much easier than the ions, which are much more massive. So if you inject a proton or deuteron in, what you find is it jiggles all the electrons, dissipates all, almost all of its energy on jiggling electrons, uh, and very little on fusion collisions with tritons. The net result is you can't really make uh, net fusion energy that way although you can produce a neutron source without too much difficulty and get some energy heating of the target, it turns out. So what you then get the feeling is that what you need to do in order to do controlled fusion is somehow produce a medium, which is, a, which is going to be a plasma, whereby all these charged particles are hitting each other with energies, average energies, greater than 10 kiloelectron volts. So what you really want is an ion temperature greater than about... 10 kiloelectron volts, and this, for almost all reasonable densities, leads to a plasma. So the idea, then, is that uh, if you want to do controlled fusion, the medium in which you are doing it by having hot particles, uh, maybe I should make a remark about cold fusion in a moment, but generally speaking, uh, in order to surmount the Coulomb potential barrier, uh, you feel like, well, I better have a hot medium greater than 10 kilovolts. A corollary um, to this is then you can say, well, uh, uh, why don't I just do it in the sun? And the answer is the sun's a little large as, a, as, a, as an energy source. So let's see how fast these particles go. So I can calculate the ion thermal velocity of these particles. And that'll be just 2 times the ion temperature divided by the ion mass times c squared times the velocity of light c. At least that's my easy way of calculating it. So this is 2 times 10 to the fourth divided by the rest mass of a deuteron would be 2 times 10 to the ninth. Again, EV over EV. And this is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And so this factor is 1 over 10 to the fifth. And 1 over 10 to the fifth Take the square root of that, and that's 1 over 3 times 10 to the 2. And so it turns out this is like 10 to the 6th meters per second. Well, that sort of says these energetic ions, okay, 10 kilovolt ions, are going to move 100 or 1,000 kilometers in a second, okay? Well, we think that's a little far. We had in mind something that wasn't thousands of kilometers long, and, you know, a second turns out to be an energy confinement time we'd like to have. So we get into the subject of what's called um, confinement, magnetic confinement and inertial confinement of plasmas. So to review this, and then I think we're about ready for a break. Um, the, to review this, the idea is, and, and then we'll talk about some specific applications in a moment, but the idea is that uh, to, in order to get this net energy from this exothermic reaction, uh, we have to have a, an, an, an um, um, interaction energy because the two particles are fairly energetic of 5 or 15 kilovolts. So I'm writing that down as sort of 10 kilovolts. And at that energy, 10 kilovolts, uh, we know that we pretty well have ion, a fully ionized plasma because of the fact that at 10 kilovolts, we're, you know, the ionization energy was only 13.6 eV. So because of that, we know we're in a, we know we're in a pretty well likely, it depends on the density, but anyway, 
almost entirely in a plasma state. And then secondly, because of, of the fact that these particles are moving at 10 to the 6 meters per second, uh, that's going to tell us that we're going to need confinement of some variety. And so we'll come back and talk a little bit about confinement and how that goes with plasma, uh, with plasmas in just a moment here.